Hello there, my name is Adam Butler and I'm the Chief Investment Officer at Resolve Asset Management. I'd like to personally thank you all for joining us for this fourth webinar in our 2018 webinar series called Asset Allocation and Institutional Perspective. Standard portfolio optimization techniques are often based on the impossible premise that investors can reasonably predict future returns with great precision. And as we know, portfolio optimization is highly sensitive to return inputs. In fact, Chopra and Ziemba showed in 93 that errors in expected means are over 50 times as impactful as errors in estimated covariances for conservative investors. Today, systematic trader, writer, and research consultant Robert Carver will address these and other fundamental issues of portfolio choice in a presentation titled, Portfolio Optimization When You Don't Know the Future or the Past. This is a timely topic as we've just published the third article in a comprehensive series on portfolio optimization. We invite you to explore the series at investresolve.com slash blog. Robert Carver is an independent systematic futures trader, writer, and research consultant, and is also currently a visiting lecturer at Queen Mary University of London. Formerly, Robert was head of fixed income and eventually a senior research fellow at Man AHL. He's the author of Systematic Trading, a unique new method for designing trading and investing systems, and Smart Portfolios, a practical guide to building and maintaining intelligent investment portfolios. Robert has a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Manchester, and a master's degree also in economics from Brookbeck College, University of London. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it along to Rob to begin the presentation. Okay, thanks very much, Adam, for inviting me along today to, to talk about this. So, quantitative finance uh, in general is, is about pretending that we, we think we can predict the future um, by kind of extrapolating what's happened in the past. That's pretty much it. I mean, sometimes uh, we kind of make it sound a bit more complicated than that, but fundamentally, mostly what we do is analyzing things that have happened in the past uh, and trying to extrapolate from that and assume that something similar to that will happen in, in the future. Um, now, this presentation is about the fact that actually we have a great deal of uncertainty even about the past. And that's kind of a, a strange thing to think about, and I'll ex explain what I mean about that a bit later on. Um, and all of this is in the in the context of optimizing portfolios, so about finding the, the correct weights um, for, for different assets in a portfolio. But actually, it applies more generally to pretty much all of um, quantitative finance, where we're making any kind of uh, de trading or investing decision based on what's happened in historic data in, in the past. So there, there's the usual kind of uh, legal stuff that, that we have to put on these things uh, nowadays. Okay, so. This is kind of the, the roadmap of, of where I'm going today. So I'm going to start off with a really brief introduction to portfolio optimization. And I guess most people who are watching this probably have a pretty good idea of what's involved in uh, using the standard portfolio optimization tools. Um, so this is really just a quick reminder and also to tell you exactly how I'm doing it because people have different methods. And although the method you use doesn't have a, a great deal of impact on what I'm talking about today, it's just important to be clear on those things. And I'm then going to introduce what I think are the real two main problems with any kind of portfolio optimization uh, method. Uh, and that's the, the, the nightmares of the fact that the problem is very unstable. And the inputs into it, the, uh, the parameters that, that we use to produce the results we want, are highly uncertain. And then I'll go into more detail about what I mean by uncertainty. And in particular, this idea of of the past itself being uncertain. Uh, and the kind of fancy jargon for what I'm talking about here really is something called a, the distribution of a, a parameter, the sampling distribution of a parameter. So parameter is, is just really anything that, that we can estimate from, from past data using statistics. Um, so the actual portfolio weights themselves that come out of a portfolio optimization problem, they themselves have a sampling distribution. Uh, and we'll look at that first. And then we'll think about the things that actually go into the portfolio optimization to decide what those weights should be and what their sampling distribution is. And also how that actually affects uh, what the final portfolio comes out like. And this really is the, the main kind of important part of the presentation. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of say, well, you know, all this, this talking about the past, Rob, you know, the past is interesting, but, but what about the future? That's what we really care about. 
what implications does this have for what we really care about, which is trying to forecast the future? And I'll show you the, the kind of the problems you get when looking at the uncertainty of the past pretty much give you the same uh, issues in, in when you're trying to forecast the future. Uh, and then I'll basically wrap up by saying, well, OK, we, we have these problems and we can recognize them. What, what should we do about them? When we're actually going in back to our offices and doing portfolio optimizations and trying to work out how to allocate uh, between you know, different assets uh, and different instruments, what should we do differently? How should we take into account all this uncertainty when we actually come down to, um, to doing things in reality? Um, and if there's time, I'll, I'll talk about a specific kind of optimization, um, which is specifically geared to dealing with this problem of uncertainty. And I'll talk about how you should kind of tune and calibrate that with, with the messages that, that you'll hopefully get uh, from this talk. OK. So in very, very general terms, um, there's a little bit of math on this page. I'll hopefully not bombard you with too many Greek letters today, but there's a few on this page. But in very broad terms, the problem of portfolio optimization is trying to find some portfolio weights to different assets that maximize something uh, given some estimates of likely future returns. Now, in this webcast specifically, um, we're going to be maximizing um, the, the mean over the standard deviation, that's mu over sigma in Greek letters, over various weights. And uh, the, those mean and standard deviations, those are kind of fairly standard formulas that, that many of you will have seen before that, that we use in finance. Um, and that, that's subject to um, constraints that the weights add up to one. All that's saying really is that we're going to invest all of our cash. Um, we're not going to leave anything uninvested. And we're also not going to be using leverage. And that all the weights are positive, which just means that you know, we're not doing any short selling. Um, and um, the, you know, the rest of the lesson is just fairly self-explanatory. An important message here is in this presentation, what I'm doing is maximizing a, a risk-adjusted return, okay, which you can think of as, as a bit like a sharp ratio, but I'm ignoring the, the risk-free rate, uh, which, which doesn't just makes things a little bit simpler, but doesn't really have a, a, a big message with respect to how you know, the main message of this, of this talk, which is really about uncertainty rather than about the specific mechanics of how the optim specific optimization works. Quite a few people will do this differently um, and will maximize returns subject to some constraint on risk. So they'll say something like, I'm prepared to have, you know, a risk of 15% uh, standard deviation a year. Um, and, um, you know, I want to maximize re my return given that constraint. Again, Doing it that way won't really affect uh, the message of this presentation. You'll still run into exactly the same issues and problems. Um, I'm just start not doing it that way today. So to actually run this thing through and, and get some, some weights out, what do we actually need? Well, we need three things. We need to know how well different assets are like to perform on average their mean return. We need to know how risky uh, assets are expected to be, the, the standard deviation of the return of various assets. And we also need to know how similar the returns of different assets are, their correlation. Um, now, correlation and standard deviation don't actually appear in, in, um, in these formulas. What you see there is the covariance. Uh, but the covariance is just, you know, essentially a, a product of the correlation and the standard deviation. So um, I prefer to, to break things down into these three categories. Uh, and actually, during this presentation, um, I'm going to kind of re restructure those things slightly um, and say, well, actually, what I really care about is the average risk-adjusted return of an asset. Uh, and again, that we're just going to use like a simple uh, sharp ratio without risk-free return there. So that's just going to be the mean over the standard deviation. Um, the, the standard deviation itself and the correlation. Um, so that's that's the inputs into my optimization, and I can. I can take those um, three things there um, and just you know, do simple, simple maths and produce the, the mean and the covariance matrix, which is what actually goes into the, the real optimization. But it's, it's much nicer to, to think about things like this. OK, so let's talk then about instability and uncertainty. Start with instability. So, I guess a lot of people have, have tried doing standard portfolio optimizations and just getting like huge numbers of assets, putting them in, and, and it, it generally doesn't work very well. So you, you tend to get 
um, unstable results, you tend to get just one or two assets having a lot of the weight um, and other assets having nothing at all. Um, that's a kind of, you know, standard problem. And it's really hard to see intuitively why that's happening. So what I think is much easier is if we really boil things down to a very small number of assets. So there's going to be a few slides here where we're going to look at just three assets, uh, A, B, and C. And we're just going to do some really simple optimizations with some very boring numbers and just see what the standard uh, optimization formula comes out with and says are the, are the, the weights for these things. And that'll give us a real insight into you know, what this problem of instability is and where it's coming from. So let's start with a really boring set of three assets. So these three assets, A, B, and C, have all got the same common correlation, which is 0 0.9. So they're quite highly correlated. They've all got the same expected return, 4%. And they've all got the same standard deviation, uh, 8%. Those are both annualized numbers. So if we pop everything above there, the kind of black box of optimization through it, um, the weights pop out of the bottom. Uh, and they all get 33.3%. Um, now, you know, that, that intuitively makes sense to me. If you've got three assets that are completely identical, then the, the mean variance process should not be able to pick between them, should get each of them exactly the same weight. So this, is, this makes sense to me, at least. And the interesting thing is, is that this kind of produces the same results even if you have um, assets uh, with different correlations. So here we've got three assets. They've all got correlations of zero, so they're, you know, they're very different assets indeed. Um, but the same mean and the same standard deviation. Uh, again, the optimization says, I can't really choose between these things. They're all pretty similar. OK, so now let's make life a bit more interesting. Let's say that two of the assets, A and B, um, have a reasonably high correlation of 0.7. Um, and then say that asset C is quite different. It has a correlation of 0. And again, we've got equal means and standard deviations. Now the optimization does something more interesting. It says, OK, asset C is different. It's diversifying. Um, I should, it's going to add more value to my portfolio if I give that a higher weight. Um, so we, we push some of our uh, allocation into asset C, um, leaving less in A and B. So again, I think this makes nice intuitive sense. And those weights you know, look, look kind of sensible. You know, intuitively, they feel, they feel right. OK, so now let's try playing with the standard deviation. So we've got three assets that are very uncorrelated um, and they have the same return. But we're going to make one of those assets a little bit riskier. So we, we put the standard deviation of asset C up to 12%. Uh, and now we, we get weights that are a little bit more extreme. So asset C gets quite a bit less, um, less than half the weight of the other two, just from that extra risk coming in. But again, it's still fairly sensible and not too crazy, I think. OK, so now things start to go horribly wrong. So this is just compare these two portfolios. OK, so this portfolio, the assets are uncorrelated. And asset C has got quite a lot higher standard deviation and comes out with, you know, with, with a little bit less weight. Here, the three assets are highly correlated, 0.9. Asset C has a little bit more standard deviation. So instead of going from 8 to 12, it goes from 8 to 8.5. So it's only got a tiny, tiny bit more standard deviation. It's just a little bit riskier. That tiny increase in estimated risk is enough for the optimizer to say, well, hang on, you know, asset C has no place in my portfolio. I'm going to give it a zero weight. I'm just going to completely throw it out. So this is this first example of the instability of, of this process. Um, and it's coming in when, when they have these very high correlations. Um, very high correlations really screw you up. They mean that if your standard deviations are only slightly different, it's going to give a zero weight uh, and a very, a very unstable portfolio. And here's a similar thing. We, so we've still got high correlations. Now this time, all the standard deviations are the same. And this, one, this time, what we're going to do is just put a little bit higher mean, a little bit higher average return for asset C. Uh, and that's enough to completely screw up the optimizer. The optimizer says, well, I love asset C. It's fantastic. It's got this, you know, tiny, tiny premium on return. But that's enough for me to say, yeah, yeah I just want asset C and nothing else. It gives it 100% weight. And this is the kind of thing you see a lot. And here's, here's an example of, of how, again, contrasting these two. So 
high correlations meant that only a tiny increase in the mean was enough to completely throw the optimizer off, put all the weights in one asset. Um, now we've, we've got zero correlations again, so these assets are quite different. And what that means is that even with this time with the mean return being you know, quite a lot higher, so going from 4% for the others to 6%, um, asset C does get more uh, as a result of that, but it don't, we don't get this ridiculous situation where we get 0, 0, or 100. So, in summary, um, high correlations are bad. Um, they mean that, that, that they really screw up the optimizer. They mean that a very small difference in the mean or the, the standard deviation will produce an extreme portfolio. Um, if you've got very low correlations, correlations are zero, then things look better. Now, of course, the bad news is that most of the time we're working in domains where the correlations are, are relatively high. So, you know, if you're um, a guy who's investing in the S&P 500, um, then you've, you've got a bunch of stocks who are going to have correlations of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, perhaps. Um, so, you, you know, you're, very, you're going to have to really watch the inputs into your optimization. It could produce some very unstable results. Um, you know, there are some situations where you've got uh, relative uncorrelations, but, you know, you're not going to find 500 assets with a correlation of zero. Once you start looking for assets, you're going to run out of ones that are independent pretty quickly. So this high correlation is a very real problem with portfolio optimizations.